If any of you guys are into social media, I got some, some stickers up here. Uh, we are running a little fun thing because the Star Wars movie is coming out. You probably maybe saw the stormtroopers running around. Got some stickers here. After the session, you can come up and, uh, and get one. But there is a hashtag underneath. So if you uh, put a tweet or a Facebook out um, and you do hashtag Jedi engineer and then some kind of funny kind of thing, right? Uh, then you will have the chance to win a $700 watch before you're going home today. And the reason that it's so important that I say this is because when I was down for lunch, I walked over and the only ones who have done this so far were the people who was in my class yesterday. So there's only like a handful of people in this content for $700 watts. So it might be something to consider. Of course, if you have $1,000 watts, maybe you don't care. <laughs> I don't know. All right, so just a, a quick agenda here of the roadmap of what we're going to do today, um, because that's always good to know where we're going. Uh, so just going to do a couple of minutes about uh, who I am. Uh, like I said yesterday in my presentation yesterday, I would much rather go around and do two minutes about you guys, because I'm selfish and I'm more interested in learning about what you guys are doing, what you're doing with software and things like that. So definitely, uh, I know we're getting to the end of, of uh, AU. I can't wait to sleep in my own bed. Um, but I will be down in the manufacturing area, advanced manufacturing area down there uh, in, the, in the exhibit hall. I would love to just, you know, have a two-minute conversation with you guys. Just love to connect with you, social media, into all that. Uh, definitely love to connect with you on LinkedIn and Twitter and all that stuff. Um, then this session here is a beginner session, uh, and I think that's important that I say that. Um, and it's on Inventor HSM, and it's really I want to try to do more the why than the how. So to me, how is mouse button clicks, right? And there's a ton of those, and you've probably seen a ton of these sessions uh, through here, and this, hopefully you all have had awesome uh, presentations to be at. But if you are new to CAM and you have not really had a chance to kind of like go through the steps, um, you can never, ever, ever really learn something on the how before you have done the why. Why the heck are we doing things? So that's what I'm kind of like going to try to do over the next hour. So it is going to be, be basic. Um, now, of course, you guys who are more experienced, uh, you always can sit here and laugh at me if I'm doing something wrong or something else like that. Um, so this is kind of like what we're going to do. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the flow of toolpath creation inside of Inventor HSM, kind of like how it kind of like works. Then we're going to go in and look at some of the different toolpaths. I always have a giveaway. So even if you think that I'm boring to listen to or the material is just way too easy, there is a giveaway. It's easy. Um, so, so just know that. And then in the end, in the third period, we're going to talk about creating setup. And then, of course, questions. So I'm all for that. Um, now, through this presentation here, if there are any specific things you want to bring up, um, you know, don't, don't sit on it till the end. I might just ask you to wait and remember it. You can use your brain cells to remember it. Um, or maybe we answer it right there, right? You know, if you like, hey, go back or something. All right, so my name is Lars Christensen. Um, and there's my email address. That's always good to have somebody at Autodesk email address. Um, I'm good at forwarding things to other people who have more brains than I do. Um, I got 20 plus years in design and manufacturing industry. Um, going all the way back to a uh, long, long time ago, uh, mold makeup trade, um, have run a, uh, a machine shop, um, a shop floor, uh, three shifts and all that stuff. And when people ask me what, what I like to do, I like to help people who just hate struggling with their design and manufacturing software. Because I think that that's, that's, that's the worst, right? Because one of the things that I believe is that your design and your manufacturing package is just a dang tool. Especially when it comes to, to machining, CAM is just, it's just another tool in your toolbox to get that part made. Because getting that part made is what is all about, okay? And the journey there should be as easy as possible. Uh, so that's what I try to, to do. Do a lot of YouTube videos and things like that. And if there's anything that is missing, 
then it's on me to, to make sure that some of that content is created. Um, if you are thinking about the, the accent, uh, I live in the United States, but I've been over here for 16 years, um, and I was born and raised in Denmark. I made that um, in red, just uh, because something about Denmark might come up later, so if you want to do a little Google thing with a giveaway or something to read up on Denmark, it might be a good idea. Um, and then also, I do have a blog called catcamstuff.com, uh, and that has been around for like eight years now. Um, I try to post something once a week, twice a week, but there's a lot of different content out there too, looking for tips and tricks, um, some cat ideas, and some different things, reviews on, on 3D mouse and all that kind of stuff. So uh, definitely more than happy to check, to check that out. All right, so um, by the way, I got to give credit though that he's not here, and he probably never hear this recording. My colleague Jay uh, is the guy who made this drawing here. I just love when they do that. Take like a 3D model and bring it out of a 2D drawing. All right, so this is kind of like the four steps. I mean, like I said, this was basic. Uh, this is kind of like the four steps to go through and, and make a part with Inventor HSM. Okay? So you stand out with your CAD, right? And, and what we love about Inventor HSM is it's working right inside of Inventor, right? So you're already inside of the environment. And um, you can model your parts up in there. You can model your fixtures. That was one of the things I talked a little bit about yesterday. So, um, you know, fixture design was really, for me personally, when I got involved with 3D CAD, was uh, what, where I found the benefits. So I was working at the time in a machine shop, and we, we got CAD in, and I was a little bit like, all right, this 3D looks pretty cool, until I realized that you can really utilizing it for fixture building to hold your, hold your parts for work holding. Then, of course, we're going into CAM, and uh, that is where we, uh, we apply our tool path. So the way it really just works inside of Inventor is we get another ribbon bar up here, have a little tab and you'll see that. We have a little feature tree, operations tree up here. Uh, so just like inside of Inventor, we are building up the different tool paths as we're going through. Um, and um, the way that the CAM software works is that when you're applying your tool path, you are applying the tool path right to that 3D model. Um, and there's some advantages of that. It actually, it actually attaches itself to the face of the model. So every, when you're creating a 3D model, uh, every face has a face ID. So this is happening inside of Inventor in the background. Every face has an ID, and, uh, and what the CAM software does is it attaches itself to that ID. What is cool about that is a couple of things. First of all, it's cool that you are not doing any translation going from your CAD to your CAM. You're literally applying those tool paths right to the same model as you have modeled up, if you're the designer or engineer, or if you've gotten it from somebody else. The other thing is that if anything changes on that model, if a pocket becomes bigger or a hole moves, well, since it's associated with that, it's going to come up and say, hey, I want to move with it. Okay? And if you, you know, my, in my past life, I used to get a 3D model from a customer, and I would sit down in my CAM software, and I would program it and get everything set up, I'll go out to the machine, you know, you get it all set up and you're ready to hit the green button on the machine, and then suddenly the phone rings, right? Anybody ever, ever, ever not had a design change? I cannot ever remember working on a part where at some point somebody is like, oh, we want to do this different, right? Now, if you are broken between your CAD and your CAM, and you're getting a phone call where they say, we changed A, B, and C. As a programmer, as a C and C programmer, you don't trust what they're saying, right? Because if, you, if they forgot about D, then it's going to be like two guys pointing fingers at each other, and the engineers always win over the C and C guys for some reason, right? Uh, though that the C and C guys are normally stronger. But, um, so one of the things that is really neat about this is that now where we are in the same environment, they make a change, everything updates, right? So that's kind of like how that works. When we have applied our tool path inside of um, uh, our CAM, we can then also go ahead and verify it, okay? Now, this is, there's always, you might hear some people call this simulation, right? That's up there. Um, I call it verify, 
And the reason I call it verify, ah, sometimes I maybe also say simulation, but to me, it's verification. It's not simulation. Simulation is like, it's true you can see what's happening here, but for a CNC programmer, for a machinist, you're verifying that things are not going to go crazy out on your machine, right? Because when things go wrong out of the machine, it's just, it's a lot of noise, it costs a lot of money, uh, jobs can get lost, it's just terrible. So I call it verify. So you have an opportunity to actually look inside in the software and see what's going to happen out of the machine. And then the last thing we do is we post out the G code. And this is really all it's about. All the other stuff can be pretty, can be nice looking, you can do all kinds of neat things. But this NC code is really all that matters because this is what the machine gets, right? This is what it's going to feed into the machine. All right? So that's the end of it. Uh, all the other stuff before it is just fancy tools. Empty slides means that I should stop talking to PowerPoint because that's boring and go inside of Inventor instead. All right, so um, up in the exhibit hall, there is three motor vehicles over in the advanced manufacturing area and a motorcycle. But there's three vehicles. There's only one of those vehicles that is on my Christmas wish list, and that is the BAC Mono, right, the open one. It's street legal. You can literally drive that out of your garage, drive all the way down to the track, drive around, drive all the way back again. How cool is that? Um, this is uh, probably, uh, this is, so this is the pedal assembly out of the BSC Mono. So if you go over there and you kind of like look down, that's what you will see in there. And uh, for me, there's only one part that is really worth concentrating on, and uh, that's the throttle pedal, right? My wife would maybe think the brake pedal when she drives with me, but I would be going to concentrate about the throttle pedal. Now, so the neat things about being inside of Inventor, uh, like I said before, is that, you know, we can do a lot of things in here. You can, you can build these assemblies up, um, and you can check everything in here. A lot of great things inside of Inventor, um, really, really fancy. Now, when it comes to CAM, like I said, there is a CAM... Uh, there is a, a CAM tab up here, right? So you can just switch over. And one of the things that is a little bit unique about our software when it comes, because there's also other software that is integrated inside um, of all the, CAM, all the CAD packages. But one of the things about our software is that it's the same if you're in assembly mode or if you're in part mode. There's actually some of the other CAM products out there that when you go into assembly, you're getting another interface. And that is kind of like defeated the purpose of what we are trying to do on the HSM side. Because what we are trying to do is we're trying to make a CAM package that is easy to use. That's, that's the, the main thing in there. Okay? If you want something that is really advanced and can do really crazy things, go and talk to the Dell CAM guys, Power Mill or something like that. That's what they're good at, making like crazy, fancy things. We want to make easy software. So it's actually so easy. This is right inside of Inventor. We can just at any point go in here and we can just open up this part by itself, right? This throttle pedal here, there's the throttle pedal. Um, and um, we can actually just go ahead right now and we can start throwing our tool path on it right now, right? There's no really disconnect from going from the, the, the cat to the cam. I like to actually, if I have the time, it depends a little bit on time, but I actually like to put mine inside of an assembly. Um, and I think, like I said, again, it depends a little bit about the time. But it is nice to have, you know, in this case here, I have a vice uh, on the table. I have, is that really disordered? Or is that looks pretty good? I mean, that looks pretty good. All right, so it's just when I'm standing in an ankle, it just will give you a headache. Um, so um, putting it inside of a vice, now you can kind of like resemble inside of your CAD what is happening out of the machine. Okay? And if you're doing anything like custom fixture plates to hold your parts and things like that, I would take the extra little bit of time and model it up inside of Inventor exactly as you have it out on the machine. Because it can just save you so much time that you confidently can sit down in Inventor, with Inventor HSM, program the part, and you know that's exactly what you have out on the machine. So I used to do like a lot of tombstone machining, where you put fixture plates on four sides and, you know, and that was what I would do. I would draw it up exactly inside of the software. Now there's a trust, because it's all about trust in the end. 
And, you know, when they came in and says, oh, we want to put a new fixture plate on that machine out there, I was like, fine, man, I'll just rip it off out there because I know that I know where everything is in here, okay? So that's a little, just maybe a little bit of advice to, to, to tie these two together. I did a presentation yesterday about uh, better cat for cam, where I was kind of like trying to, you know, that there is some advantages by, by trying to connect cat and cam, not just creating toolpath in there, but you can actually do some tips and tricks. So if you didn't have a chance yesterday, it's recorded and, and you will get it, you can see it there. All right, so what I just quickly wanted to show you guys here is kind of like the workflow to get through quickly uh, the steps like I outlined them before. So I've already created a setup on this part. I will get back to a setup when we machine the second side uh, on this part. Um, but I just want to kind of like show the step through. So what I have is I have defined here kind of like a stock around this part. So the way you would do this if you are manufacturing this part, this throttle pedal or pretty much any other, any other model is that you gotta, you gotta order some stock. You can't get away from that, right? If you know, oh, you gotta go out and find something on the shelf out in the, in the back. But what you will pretty much do is you will go in and say, all right, I'm gonna leave a little bit, 100 thousandths on each side, so it needs to be this wide, 100 thousandths this side a little bit, you know, so you kinda like make it a little bit bigger, right? And then uh, you cut it or you order it, and then you can put it in the device. So pretty much what I did when I put that part in was I was doing the same thing. I made it inside of Inventor just with a hundred thousandths distance from the, from the jaws, right? So it's assembling the sound itself. Um, I'm gonna come back to the setup a little bit later and show the different options in there on what you can do with stock. But that was really just how I threw this one in. Just using the standard mating inside of Inventor assembly to place it a hundred thousandths, a hundred thousandths, and, and, and that's it. Now the thing we maybe would do, the first, the first thing we would do uh, when it comes to, to machining is we would do a facing operation. And this is, why, this is how, where I'm starting to talk more about why instead of how. A facing operation is pretty much just clearing off the top. So think about you have like a piece of raw material that had been banked around, shipped, somebody kicked it out on the shop floor or whatever, and now you put it in the machine, you hold it in the device, and you just want to take a nice clean cut over the top. So that's a facing operation to do that. Just simply just making a planar surface that many times will come your datum or your zero or something like that. We do have uh, the facing tool sitting right up here. And by the way, all the tools that I'm going to be using through this presentation is in the free package. So Autodesk is giving uh, away for free the two and a half axis for uh, both um, Inventor HSM, what we're going to do here, and also if you run SolidWorks, HSM works. Okay, and that's free, it comes with posts, and it's not a 30-day trial, it's literally just because that Autodesk, when they kind of like entered into this manufacturing area, was like, you know, a lot of the, our competitors have made way too much money on selling simple cam. Just give it away, and you know, so, and, and it's awesome. So, so I'm gonna select this facing operation here. And one of the things about Inventor uh, HSM that I really like is, like I said before, it's easy to use. So when you're looking at the menus over here, these five tabs up here are always the same. They're always in the same order. They always do the same thing. The first thing you always be asked to do is pick a tool, okay? So this is one of the neat things about this. You can literally go through this presentation. You can go back home and when, if you haven't already installed the software, if you install it to play around with it, you will pretty quickly catch up again because it's, not, it's the same thing no matter what you're doing. No matter what kind of tool path you're using, you will always see five tabs and they all do the same thing. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna select a tool. So I'm gonna select a tool here and we get a tool menu um, showing up here. And let me just give you the quick little tour about what you can do here. So this is the tool window to pick your tools. So if we start down at the bottom, down here you can actually go in and you can create a new mill tool. So, you know, let's say you have a custom cutter that you want to use or something like that. That's why you can do that. I think everybody can read what the next one does. It will create you a new uh, a mill holder. So you can actually model up both the tool and the mill holder. If you do our paid package, you also get a uh, access to create a turning tool. So we also have turning inside of the product. 
that's not part of the free version but then over here we can edit and select the tools as we're adding them in here in the workspace now Inventor HSM already comes with a bunch of different tool libraries and different things over here that you can you can kind of like play through okay so I'm just gonna go in here and I'm gonna select a lot of the tutorial library and you will see the first thing here is actually a 50 millimeter face end mill now what I can do is I can actually go down and I can click edit and then it opens up another kind of menu here and you can kind of like the easiest thing is just going through the different tabs but the second one the cutter tabs is probably one of my favorite ones I don't know of any other cam software out there that has such a nice interface when it comes to edit your tool so what you're seeing here is actually uh, what a face mill looks like if you're not familiar with a face mill I actually also put it in the in the in the PowerPoint here so this is kind of like look of a face mill so this here is the side view so really what it what the idea behind a face mill is you want to just plan off the plate but you want to kind of like have a big cutter because if you have a small cut you can use a small cutter but if you have a small cutter, it's going to take a lot of small steps. If you have a big cutter, you know, then it can take bigger steps. Uh, so, so that's the idea about one of these uh, face mills or shell mills, as they also are called. Now, we like to use carbide in this industry, but if you were going to make a carbide end mill that was about this big in diameter, you'd probably have a hard time lifting it, first of all, because it's heavy. And if you dropped it, it would be very expensive, right? If it dropped it, you'll be shot. It'll be very, very expensive. So what you use is you're using this uh, little, it's, a, it's a kind of like a steel holder, and then you put these carbide inserts on them that are just screwed in. And they actually have different faces on it. So I found a real one here. This is kind of like looking from the, down at the bottom. This is probably how the stock sees the end mill coming towards them. Ah, when it comes down. Um, so I don't know if you can see this, but they actually have different shapes. So this one has one, two, three, four, five, six sides, and I think this one only has four. So you can buy these different inserts uh, in different sizes and shapes depending on what kind of like holder you get. You don't need to have a face mill. So if you were a new starting up with a shop, this would not be the first tool I bought. I would just use a standard end mill and go maybe a little bit more back and forth. Um, these inserts, so they're carbide. Now you see that they are yellow. That's because, or gold, that's because they got a coating on them uh, that should make them last a little bit longer, run a little bit smoother. There's different types of coatings in there. Uh, this looks like some kind of a tin coating or something like that. Um, generally speaking, inserts uh, last for about 20 minutes before you got to rotate them. 20 minutes in cut, and then it seems like that they're pretty much dead. Um, so, so that's what, what that tool looks like. I just kind of like wanted to to show that. Now what is really, really nice about this interface here is of course that you can now change things, right? So if you don't have a 50 millimeter, uh, you don't have, to, just because you're buying Inventor HSM, oh, now we're gonna go out and buy a 50 millimeter, that would be silly, right? So, uh, so of course you can edit all these, uh, all these in here. We're gonna come back in here in a little bit of a second. But so you always select your tool. So I'm just gonna hit select here for this face mill, okay? Now, you see that there is four more tabs up here, uh, but one of the things that is neat about being inside of a 3D environment, inside of a solid environment, is that the software knows that there's something there, right? So, so what 3D really does is it makes what is called watertight models, and the computer knows that it's in there. That's the difference between a surface model. If you, know, if you ever brought something in and it was all surfaces, because there's a little crack in the model somewhere, you can heal it sometimes, right? Um, but if you have a solid model like we have here, the software actually knows what is there. So I actually don't, if I just want to do a facing operation uh, over this part, I don't even have to select any geometry or anything. I can just hit OK because the software knows where everything is, and you will see that I get a facing operation. It shows up with a little bit of a blue and green line here going across the part. Now, now we could go in and verify or simulate um, in here to see what we actually got and that's why I call it verification and not I think simulation is just kind of cute um, because you will do that as you're creating your different tool path you constantly go in and simulate it to see if that's really what you want 
Okay, because we have all kinds of different settings we can add and edit and stuff like that, and we'll get to that. So if I go up here and hit simulate, and I go down and hit play, you will now see that we get a visual representation on, we get verification on, that we are uh, facing off the part. And we see, all right, you know, that looks pretty good. We can also turn on stock display, so that's like a checkbox right over here. So now we actually get this little uh, green box here, and now we can actually see, you know, a step over too. That could give you a little bit of indication of how much material uh, do I have in there. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. We're going to get to shit setups. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about more, more when we get there, but I, I like the way you're thinking. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, we'll talk about that when we, flip the, when we flip the part around if I don't run out of time. Any other questions? Okay. I, I have asked our development to, when we do verification with stock, I want to see chips come flying off, and they just shook their head at me. <laughs> what? And cool, and I want the cool one too. <laughs> They just, they just shook their head. They didn't even answer. <laughs> Do you also want to crash? Do you want to just hear like <laughs> sparks coming and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, now we're talking. Verification, what do you want to know what really happens? Um, yeah, so, so that's really how easy it is to create an operation inside of that. What did I do? I hit the, the facing operation, I selected a tool, and I hit OK. And this here, we can actually go now, we can go up and post this out. So if you go up and hit post process, you can now, and this is all the post that comes with even the free version, okay? So Autodesk, this is like something that some people have run into nightmares about posts uh, in the past. I just select the Haas because that's what we have down in the, in the uh, exhibit area down there. Uh, so we have a dedicated post team uh, on our, on our uh, team, and that's all they do is post. So we support post. We, we want to make sure that we have post for, for all the machines that you guys are using. Uh, and this is the code that really matters. Like I said before, my, my PowerPoint, right? This is, this, all the other stuff is just a tool. This is what we got to get out to the machine. Now, this is a fairly short code, just because we only have the facing operation at this point. Right? But I mean, you will see in here if you're familiar with, 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 with G-code, you can see we're using tool number one in making a tool change. There's a speed in there. Uh, G54 is the pickup, coolant on, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and many times when you're programming things, you don't have to program the entire part before you start machining. I mean, I would many times just do a couple of the first roughing operations, post it out, go out to the machine, Get the machine running, right? Now the owner comes out, the machine is running, you're sitting in front of your computer drinking coffee, eating a donut, programming on on the part, and he's like, oh, look at this guy, man, he's awesome, right? So, I mean, sometimes you just take small cuts, and it takes a little bit long. No, you shouldn't do that. Um, but, no, but, but that's a thing to keep in mind, though. You don't have to sit there and program everything. Get your roughing operations going, man, and then, you know, you can go in and play around with some of the other things um, along the way. All right, so from this point on, uh, we're just going to keep on putting on some toolpath uh, on this, this part here. Uh, so let's go in and uh, add a 2D adaptive uh, toolpath here. So I'm going to click on the 2D adaptive, and again, I'm going to go and, uh, and select uh, a tool. This case here, I'm going to go down and I'm going to select a... Uh, 16 millimeter flat end, end mill. I'm just going to go into edit to show you the picture. So now you can see that the, the diagram in here looks a, a little, bit, little bit different, right? Now, I just wanted to talk um, a little bit about, about tooling, because this is a thing that, that I get asked quite a bit. There is so many different types of tools out there, end mills, you know, so many different variations. And if you're new to machining, then you also, when you're talking with CNC machines, 
then you also start talking about formulas to figuring out feeds and speeds and stuff. And I remember personally uh, when, when I got involved with CNC milling, uh, I found that a little bit tricky, man. I mean, you throw these formulas at me at that point in my life, and I was a little bit like, I thought I was done with school, right? Um, I can't get them into my little calculator on my iPhone. Um, so, so that becomes a little bit tricky, and this is, a, this is a showstopper for many people. It's frustration. What do I do? You know, how do I come by this? Um, I know a couple of people, John, who's one of the guys who's here, uh, with uh, NYC CNC, who has a YouTube channel, him and I chatted yesterday. He said he had some kind of a rule that 300 divided by two or something else. Um, but really, my thing, tool vendors are your friends. Okay, so I think it's fine when you're going out buying things that you shop for the cheapest and try to get a good deal and things like that. When it comes, if you're new to CAM, just Find a, a, a tool vendor, and when you call him up to order some tools, say to him, dude, I'm kind of new in this, and uh, I need some hand-holding. And if you can't give me some hand-holding, then I'm going to call somebody else, okay? Because what they can do is they can give you some, some starting points for your feats and speeds, okay? And one of the neat things about it is, and I have done this many, many times, I would get their feats and speeds, and the tool would break. Well, then you just call them up and be like, <laughs> sorry, Joe, <laughs> it broke. And they send you another one without charging you, right? If you're standing there and you're trying to suddenly f pull numbers out of the air or something like that, then, you know, they're not going to refund you a $30, $40 end mill when you, when you smash it into it. One of the reasons that feeds and speeds is so tricky is because there's so many factors into it. Uh, of course, what material you're cutting. But also, if you go down on the, sh on the floor, down in the education area, we have a VF2 making these small, cool cars. Then you can walk over in the other area where we have like these small tabletop machines that runs. That's like running a semi versus, you know, a little go-kart. And the tool's going to be run different in that. How are you holding on to the part? What kind of work holding are you using for the or tool holding are you using? So there's so many factors. So tool vendors are your friends. If you're starting out, just rely on them to feed some speeds, and you will start picking it up. I always carry a little notebook. I'll always write down, oh, so for that half-inch end mill, he, he said this and this, so I could always go back through it. There is so many out there. There's just, you know, there's some rules by thumb. This is mine. Don't worry about high-speed cutting for standard cutters. We're only using carbide in, in this industry. Okay, if you're using standard end mills, carbide. Don't go with high speed. That was, you know, ages ago. Don't worry about coatings unless your tool vendor says, well, you know, you have a little bit of special application. You're doing production. You're trying to kick out, you know, you're trying to take 10 seconds of a cycle time, and we can extend your tool life by 10% by adding a coating. If not, don't worry about it. Fall fluid is standard. Okay? If I had to go out and buy right now, if you came to me and says, all right, let's start out, you're new to this, what would I go? I would say, just give me a fall flute. That is, and you can, if you look at these fall flutes here, you like see this one here, can you see how these two are connected, but these two are not? It's the same thing over on this one. So this is center cutting. They can actually cut straight down. Um, but when I'm talking about fall flute, it's depending on how many flutes are on here. And it's really about how big of a chip you can take. So if you are machining anything that is hardened, that have been heat treated, then you maybe have more flutes. But if you're cutting something like plastic and aluminum, you might go down to three or two flutes uh, because you can have a bigger chip between the flutes. But if I had to go out and buy, uh, I would just, just give me four flute. That's out of the gate. And this is the three different sizes I would order, depending on if you want an inch or metric. There's a billion different sizes in between, but this here, for most people's standard work, this here will get the job done. Right? And if I didn't have money to buy a facing mill, I would just face mill a half inch end mill and just go over a little bit more. Okay? But really, my biggest thing I always tell people is, you know, talk to your tool vendors. They're more than happy to help you um, and, um, and, and kind of like get you going. And sometimes they also have like free t-shirts and stuff like that. Is that a rule of thumb? Well, you, you, you can, right? If it's center cutting like this one, you can actually plunge down with it, yes. 
All right. So uh, I'm going to use this adaptive here. Now, when it comes to uh, the adaptive tool pads, I'm going to select this 16 millimeter end mill. I'm going to go to the second tab. So the second tab we have in here is all about selecting geometry. So the first tab is the tool. The next thing is about selecting geometry. Now, for our facing operation, the software knew where the stock was, so we didn't have to select anything. But now when we're doing the 2D adaptive, we have to select uh, something. So I'm just going to go down and select uh, this bottom edge down here. And when I select that bottom edge, you will see that we kind of like get a verification of the area that we're going to be machining. There's a little arrow, arrow, arrow. <clears throat> it's Thursday. Arrow right there. And uh, I get so excited, I talk fast. And I can flip the tool path back and forth uh, with that. So you can see kind of like how we're losing the blue shadow, depending on what side we want to be on. That's actually all we have to do for the adaptive, and we can click on that. And we now generate uh, a tool path. Looks something like that. Now, there is more settings for this tool path that we can mess with. But just to show you, we really only have to do those two tabs for this tool path here. And if I go in and verify this, I'm just going to select the setup, hit simulate. And I can actually turn all those yellow and blue lines off if I want to. And you will now see that, again, we have our facing operation that is already running out of the machine. And then you will here see uh, the, the adaptive uh, tool running in here. Now, the adaptive tool is a little bit different. It's called a roughing tool path. I don't like that, uh, because if you had come to me when I used to uh, be on the floor at Ridlam, and you came and says, oh, we got this fantastic roughing tool path, I would have been like, I don't rough much. But adaptive clearing is actually a little bit different than just a standard roughing tool path. Um, if we go over here, and take a quick look. Uh, the way the software works is this is standard. A standard pocketing operation will just kind of like take this out of shape and see you kind of like offsetting it in. But what adaptive does is it keeps a constant chip load on your cutter. So the software looks at what the stock is, what the part is, and it calculates so it keeps a constant load on the cutter. That means that we can cut a lot faster, but for some people it's great, for some people don't care about it. But the other thing about it is, and this is what sells me on it, is it gives you a lot less tool wear. Okay, because the tool is not going and suddenly hits a lot of material and then a little bit less and then more and less. Okay, and it's actually also good for your machine, what any owner, of course, would love, because it keeps a constant load uh, on that. So what you will see is, this is slow motion, you can actually go full depth with the cutter and you get these beautiful chips flying right off here. And if you go to any machinist and you, uh, you show them that, they, they, they think that's the best thing. If you, if you are new uh, and, and are new to machining, just I tell you, just use the depth of clearing. Uh, if you're an old timer who've been around for a while, I tell you, man, it's, it's the best tool path that I have ever, ever used. Now, the next thing I'm going to do, so the adaptive did leave a little bit of stock on our part here. I'm just afraid that I'm going too slow. Um, so I'm going to go into a, to finish the outside, and I'm going to use a 2D contour for that. Now, a 2D contour is pretty simple. What you do is, again, hit 2D contour, of course, select the tool. Sometimes you will use the same tool to rough uh, and finish. Sometimes you really can't just because the rough will wear a little bit more. I'm just going to go one down in size here for 10 millimeter. And uh, so, so that's easy. So you're going to select your tool. What I'm going to machine, I'm going to select the same edge as I did before to machine this. And uh, many times what I do when I'm programming as I inventor HSM, I really don't waste a lot of time going through all the different tabs. It sometimes it's a lot easier just to hit OK and see what you get. Just see what you get and be like, all right, that is pretty cool. Now, if you ever want to change anything, it's super easy. So what I'm looking at here is this end mill is going to come in over here. If I wanted to come in over here instead, you know, that could be a typical example where I hit OK. I'm like, oh, dang it, I wanted it over there. All you do to get back into the tool path is you just go over and you right click and you hit edit. And you're right back in where you were before. Now, I can go over. The next tab over here is the Heights tab. 
Um, we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, and then there is the passes tab, what has everything to do with the cutter engaged in the material. So the cutter's inside of steel. That's all the different settings in there. And then, and you can see there's a lot of settings, right? Oh my goodness, look at all these checkboxes, right? So you have all the power you need to do all kinds of crazy things, but you have seen already, you don't have to turn them all on to do simple standing machining. The last one is the linking tab, but has everything to do with the cutter not engaged in the material. So me entering the part is on this last tab because it's, it's not engaged in the material yet. So I can actually go down here and hit the entry point down here in the bottom, and I can literally just go over and select right on that 3D model right there. And when I hit OK, you will see that I now just have changed that lead in. That's how simple it is if you want to make changes in that. It doesn't have to be so difficult to do. Okay. Up here, we have a little bit of a shelf. See a little step over over there? The contour of tool path might be pretty good for that too. So I'm just going to go in and I'm just going to hit it again, contour. I'm going to leave it at the same tool, 10 millimeters. That works out. This time, I'm just going to go over and select this edge right there. And then I'm just going to go over and hit OK, see what I get. There's no really reason to go through all the steps and sit there and think about it too much. See what you get up on the screen. Because remember, we have this really cool simulation of Verify where we can go in and see what the steps are as our tool go through, right? We got our facing. We got our roughing operation. And you can just you see how the bar is running down here. You can actually just click anywhere on that one and just fast forwarding right over to that point. So there's the going around. And there we can see we're doing our contour operation. Cool? But now you see that we actually have a little bit of a sliver right there. Huh. This is why I call it verify. Every time you're applying a tool pass, you go in here and you're like, oh, that was the last tool pass I did. So I'm just going to go in here. And I'm going to right click and hit edit. And where am I? Back right in where I'm setting all my settings. Right? So I need to do something with that little sliver. Well, that is when my cutter is in the material, what will be, as always, the fourth tab for passes. So I'm going to go over there. And then I can go down and say, you know what? I want some multiple step over finishes. So I'm just going to go ahead and say, you know, I practice, so I know four steps will be good. But in real life, you could, of course, just test it out, right? 100 step over, click OK. And now you will see that I got those step overs there. What means that when we now go in and simulate it, we now know, I know, if you trust me, you don't have to, that now that sliver is gone, right? That is really the basic steps of machining through here and see uh, what is going on. Another thing that I really like to show that we can do inside the simulation is we can show transparent. Now we are actually showing the part behind it. So now we see the model between the, that's pretty cool. And we can compare the two together. That's kind of nice too. Now we can see everything in blue have, is not finished. Anything in gray are finished. That's kind of neat, right? So now you don't have one. Many times when you're machining things, you will use a big cutter to machine something, like a pocket. And then you have to pick out the corners with a smaller cutter. And I can tell you how many times I've been standing out of the machine and be like, oh, <laughs> I forgot that, right? Well, here you can see it right in your face, right? We're missing something, OK? Now, the other thing, of course, we can do in here is we can drill some holes. So I'm going to go up here and hit the drill operation. And in here, we only have four tabs just to confuse the enemy. We don't need more. Now, since this is steel, we will many times go in and we will actually spot first. Because a standard uh, drill um, is um, standard drill is 118 angle. The tip point of a, of a, of a standard Java drill is 118 degrees. And uh, what happens is if you don't spot first, then when you try to drill, and drill want to wander, and then you don't have a hole where you want it. You can actually, so, th so they make actually now like 120 degrees, then they actually start centering themselves a little bit better. But this is just a little spot drill. I should actually have just hit the edit so you could see the image. So this is a little spot drill. You can also many times use these to chamfer with. 
Now, to select my, my, uh, my geometry for the drilling operation, I want to show this. Uh, many times it's the simple things. There's a checkbox saying select same diameter. What that means is that when I select my hole in here, it picks all three. <laughs> I love being lazy when it comes to CAD and CAM. That's just my motto, man, right? But I can still add more holes. So if I were going over here, I can actually add that right there and it just adds it to it, okay? The third tab we have is the Heights tab. Now, what the height tab is, this is where we are controlling things uh, for different heights in here. So how the machine is moving around inside of our, um, inside of our environment, okay? So um, when the machine is moving around in here, it's going to clear the parts sitting in the, in the workflow. And then I wanted the real picture, and I spent probably about 45 minutes this morning sitting down in the exhibit hall, looking on Google to find a good image of how it looks inside the machine, and then I went over to the educational booth and snapped the picture with my phone. It was stupid. Um, so what you can see, is this, right? Isn't this the life? That's just my life, man. So you have your tool here, and what the clearance page does is it's making sure that we can clear other things inside of our machining area. That's really what it does, or how it's approaching uh, things in here. So you will see there's a clearance height where how is it going to move away when it's got to go to the tool changes and retract between different operations. What I can do in here, so right now you will see the bottom height for this drill. Oh, and by the way, of course, when you hover over, you get a lot of explanation. Uh, when I hover over here, you will see that right now it's looking for the bottom of the hole. What would be great if I was drilling all the way through, but I'm just spotting. I'm just trying to make a little mark in the steel for my drill to catch. So I really don't want to go that deep. Well, if I hit the drop down, you will see that there is a lot of different options in here. And you just really just got to find the one that, that fits you. So in my case here, I'm going to select the model top. But notice that I can just put in an offset. So if I want to go 100 thousands down from the model top with that spot drill, that's what I've done. Click OK. And now we have spotted uh, that simple little thing there. Let me turn this dog off for a second. Right? So that was just spotting, just like that. Now, we can do a drilling operation. We've got to drill the holes, too. So, like I said, I like to be lazy. Um, I can, you can actually right-click on our operation, and you can go down and say, Create Derived Operation. And then you can select whatever you want to do. So we're going to just add the drilling operation. So I'm going to click on that, and it is asking me to select a tool. And I know from memory that those tools are a 10-millimeter drill, and then I just lost my focus, there. But using derived, I don't have to select any geometry. That's the neat thing about derived. You're pretty much taking the, first, the operation with the spotting and just copying it down. And now you can just change the things that you want to add. So in this case here, I don't want to go 100,000 from the top anymore. That would kind of like be dumb, right? I actually want to go all the way through maybe my stock bottom, if I want to drill it all the way through the plate. And you can even add a little bit of extra material in there. If you want to make sure that you go a little bit deeper through there, you can do that. And now we have added that, um, that operation in there, that drilling operation. Right? So now you can see we're drilling, drilling through there. OK? Good stuff? All right. Let's do a giveaway. Sorry, I'm thirsty, man. This dry air is just killing me. All right, so I talked a little bit earlier about that uh, I am from Denmark. That was highlighted. I know you all have been Googling up and know now that you know, we're the oldest monarchy and all this stuff. Um, I hope this is not too hard. We're going to figure out what flag is the Danish flag. OK? So I hope that that was part of, of what you kind of like uh, Saw them? No? Nobody's? I thought that was funny. All right. See? Led you? All right. So uh, many people don't know that I am uh, actually living in upstate New York. And uh, upstate New York actually makes some good wine. So I brought a. Uh, 
a bottle of wine uh, from upstate. Now you can either drink it tonight or you can drag it back home. What, uh, what is your shirt size? And then also, <laughs> there's three choices, and there's number three. That's large. Uh, got some advanced manufacturing shirts, and of course, we have the integrated cam inside of there. So thank you for playing along, man. Thank you for staying. I can't remember what is on the next slide here. OK, that's fine. So um, the last thing I want to do here, because I want to have some questions, but we just talk about work setup, and I think this is important. So let's just move on here to, to finish this part. So I had already set the setup on this part in the beginning. And the reason I didn't want to get into the setup is because if you're a new user, it's just a little, maybe a little confusing, and I, it's just not a good way to learn. But what we got to do with this part when we have machined all this stuff here is that we probably have to flip it over. When we have machined all this stuff we have over here. Oh, and by the way, can you guys see how I have some red lines here? I actually have some collisions, that's true. So now we can find out where the heck I did something. Oh, it's just on the drilling. It's probably my, my offset height here. That's not a problem. Um, so when we have programmed this whole part, <clears throat> and there was a couple of more features in there, but that doesn't really matter. When we're getting to this point, now we have to flip the part over on the other side and kind of like machine off using that face mill uh, again to maybe clean off the remaining of the stock we have in here. So what we do inside of Inventor HSM is we're creating a new setup to do that second operation. Now, there's a lot of different ways you can probably work around things. I'm just going to do it the lazy way uh, right now because we've already confirmed that that's kind of like the path that I'm at. Uh, just don't tell my boss. Well, you can. Uh, so I'm just going to hide everything here. Um, but actually, one of the things, so yeah, and I, what you maybe would have to do on a part like this is you had to make some special jaws to hold on to it. Um, I'm actually creating a, when it was brought up yesterday, I'm actually creating a video out of my YouTube channel um, where I'm going to show how to make soft jaws. So if you're interested in that, I'm going to do something about that. But what we're going to do now is we're going to machine the back side of it. Now, one of the problems we can have is that we machine the first side, and now we flip it over. And you brought it up. I always pick up in the upper corner, or you saw that yesterday, maybe seen in some of the videos that I've made it. Um, what I actually I would do, do on this part personally, as you maybe know, I drilled that hole, all the holes through. I would have drilled the holes all the way through, and then I would have machined them too, circular machined them, and this would be the hole I would be picking up as my organ. But that doesn't really, you know, it's just different ways you can do things. When you go in to create a setup inside of Inventor, it's going to come in and ask me if it thinks it's an assembly. All right. So when you're bringing it in here, the reason we are doing a setup is because we have to tell the software how things are out of the machine. You have a CNC machine, you go out to a CNC machine, that's pretty much how that thing's going to stay. Everybody got a model where somebody modeled on the front instead of the top or the right and it's up, right? <laughs> and beat those guys up. Um, you're not going to go out to the machine and tip the machine up on the side if they, right? You kind of like got to do it inside the software. So that's what we're doing with this, with this setup. It's very simple to do. The easiest thing, anytime you're inside of a menu, I don't care if it's Inventor HSM, Inventor, Fusion, whatever, always just start from the top and work your way down. So this is a milling operation, so I don't have to change into a turning operation. If here, we are setting the coordinate system. So this is where the G54 or where the zero, zero point is going to be for the machine, OK? Now, if I go to the first one, here I can select. So you see I have this gnomon over here, or the, the, uh, the triad. That is displaying what is up and down, what is x and y out of the machine. Generally speaking, the blue z-axis got to be up. That's kind of like coming down, OK? That's what I got to move in here. They have, the, the, our developers are awesome. I love them. They have all these different options, but I can honestly tell you I have only used this one. I never used the other ones. I just always use like Z axis plane. So um, I, just to make it easy to take all the other ones away. No, I'm sure people have used for them. But what it does when you select them is I can now go in 
And whatever face or edge I am selecting in here, that R, that C axis will go perpendicular to it. So I'm selecting right on that face, and you will see that my Z axis will go perpendicular to that face. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Pretty cool, eh? I could go down here and I can do things with the x-axis if I wanted to misalign align that one. I could also flip the direction on it. Do, 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 right? Whatever you want. It's fine for what I'm doing here. Then the next thing we're doing is we're selecting how we're going to select the, the, the stock. So if I go down here and select the stock point, you will see that I get all these different bubbles coming up here, in this case where I'm selecting the stock. And I can just click on any of those uh, different areas to... Uh, to show wherever I want to place it. Now you raised up, why do I always, well not always, but why do you sometimes see doing it in the upper, uh, upper left? Really the only reason is that's where my solid jaw is on my vise. Okay? Down in the bottom down here, that's the movable end. That can swing around a little bit. If you're, so you, on, a, on a vise, you have your solid jaw up here and the movable one here. That movable can actually twist a little bit, so you could actually have a little bit of a twist right down there if you how to not square. But the nice thing about doing what you're doing, I had a customer uh, who, who always, he said the same question. He's like, why don't you put it down there? I asked him, why would you put it down there? And he said, because then my code will always be positive. When I'm looking at my output in the G code and I see a minus, I know I have done something completely wrong. Okay? Now, if you're a mold maker, you might just see that it's going to be in there. Because mold makers normally like to work from the center of a mold. That's kind of like the heart. Okay? A die maker will normally select from an edge. So that's the, the, wherever you want to pick up the part, but that's the answer yours. The last thing I want to show here is be aware when you go over to your stock options that there's some great options in here. You can select different types, and you can even select from a solid. So you can actually model up your stock inside of Inventor and use it. So this is really good if you get castings, for example, or if you have an operation that first went to the lathe and now it's coming to you, that you can model it up as a solid and then uh, bring it in there. And when you have set these settings up and you hit OK, then you will see inside of the tree I now have a setup. And if I click the facing operation, and I can go in here and I can select our tool, hit select, hit OK, and now I've created that operation to, to face off uh, that. So if I did them both, you will see that we have now machined uh, both of them here. I could talk for hours and hours and hours, um, but um, this was really kind of like what I was planning on saying. Before questions, I'm just going to say it again. Up here I have stickers, and if you're using your social media, and you got to do it within the, like, the next 30 minutes, and you say something funny on Twitter or Facebook, and you put hashtag Jedi Engineer, that's a $700 watch, okay? And I was just told right before I came up here that the only ones who've done this to get the $700 watch was the people in my class yesterday. So chances are pretty good that it could be one of you guys who will get a $700 watch uh, shipped to you. And on my PowerPoint, I have this one here. I really hope that you guys will take the time. I know it's a little bit of pain in the air, uh, in, the, in the something, uh, to... <laughs> I made it so far, and now it's on recording. Um, I know it's a little bit to do these, but this is how Autodesk decides who should come back and who should not come back. Thank you so much for coming. Just ping me up for questions. I'd like to connect with you on social, down in the advanced manufacturing area. I really appreciate you guys sitting through this. I hope it was helpful. Questions? Yes? They are developing it right now. It's going to be, so I think it's like, so we just came out with a release where we added some pretty neat engraving and uh, chamfering. Have you seen those chamfering options? So chamfering is like, if you can actually deburr your part by cutting, having a little 45 degree cutter going around, right, so it's not sharp. Well, what we actually have done with our new update is if there's a vertical wall, it will not cut into it. It will stay away from anything that, where it will undercut, pretty much. Anybody who ever tried to deburr parts on a CNC machine, you have done this, right? You're like, oh, I'm just going to go around, and then you did miss some area, and <clears throat> you cut it into it. 
So that has just been added. I think there's one more thing coming before probing, but they're working on it. So I, I would think we're going to see, I haven't seen it in beta yet, but it's, it's not years, it's months, for sure. That's the main reason we haven't, we haven't seen the beta run. Okay. So what kind of software, what, what machines are you using? Uh, what machines? Yeah. We're using, uh, so you're using the pros to inspect the part or to set it up? Yeah, because I mean, I have done that in a previous job, but, but what kind of, do you know what probe it is? Renishaw? Um, yeah, because Renishaw, all Renishaw runs on is macros. So you can actually create a macro that, and we can get that in the post, that when that macro gets triggered in the post, that then it will start the probing cycle for you. So you don't really need a probe. I, yeah, I did this all, I, uh, with, with another CAM software, but where well, I didn't have probing either. So macro, you can send me an email, uh, and I will definitely get back to you. Just We can chit-chat a little bit about it. But there's a way around it that actually works fairly good. Yeah. Any other questions? But it's coming, so maybe... It's not worth it, right? No? So I know this, was, I was a little bit nervous because this was beginner, but was it good? Was it useful? Yeah. Not too boring? Okay, good. It's always interesting when you're putting these together if it's something, you know, that can be used. Awesome. Well, if you're on social, <laughs> I would recommend you, uh, you do that. I also have my card up here. Um, so definitely be more than welcome to grab that. Uh, if you have any questions, the CAM team guys are around here. Um, definitely make sure that you, you know, we support you and do you know, what you need for, from us. All right? Thank you so much, man. Awesome.